Torture and Death by S.C. Turnbow An old-timer of Boone County, Arkansas, is Hiram Harden. He's the son of Thomas Presley Harden and Minerva Starkey Harden. He was born one mile east of Belfont, May 27, 1853. His father and mother were born and reared in Giles County, Tennessee, and were married there and came to the vicinity of where Belfont is now in the year of 1846. Mr. Hiram said, My grandfather and grandmother, William Harden and Agnes Harden, came with my parents to Arkansas. My father died many years ago and was buried on an old homestead one mile east of where Belfont is now. My mother died in 1886 and her body received internment in the graveyard near Russellville, Arkansas. In reference to the early settlers of that part of Boone County at Belfont neighborhood, Mr. Hardin gives the names of the following men that he said lived there from the time he could first remember until the days that the war set in. The early day settlers were very scattering. There were Matthew Bristow, who served one term as county judge. Salem Hudson, oh, he was the brother of the man that the panther attacked on the Buffalo Mountains. This man, Salem Hudson, was the son-in-law of Mr. Bristow. Mrs. Nancy Stark, who she lived near Haraw Creek, eight miles below Belfont. Tom Bones lived northeast of Belfont. William Smith lived near Belfont, and Jim Carroll, John Poplin, and Billy Smart were all old-time people of that locality. Moss and Sam Holmes, who were brothers, were also pioneer settlers there. John Roberts and his brother Andrew lived several miles east of Belfont, and the Judge Bristow farm was a mile and a half east of my grandfather, William Harden, who lived one half of a mile west of the Bristow place. William Harden, my grandfather, owned a great deal of land and commanded a sum of money. Now, when the war broke out, he had $1,500 of gold and silver. He also had a large amount of promissory notes, which most were on responsible men. Soon after the great Civil War had got headway with the marauders, made a few attempts to secure his money. But their onslaughts were ineffectual as far as his money was concerned. They hung him twice by the neck until he was almost dead to force him to reveal his treasury to them, but he constantly refused to tell where it was hidden. As the war went on, his dwelling was burnt down, and he moved into the Judge Bristow residence. One night shortly after he moved here, the robbers paid him another visit to do their worst. My youngest brother, Stowe Carden, who was 12 years old, was living with them. In the afternoon previous of this night, my grandfather had went out into the woods alone and taken up his money where he had buried it and concealed it in another place. Grandmother said, after they had all retired, Grandfather said to her, Agnes, I have put my money in a new place, and I will tell you where it is tomorrow. At this moment, Grandfather noticed the face of a man against the glass window, peeping through the glass into the house. Grandfather called Grandmother's attention to it immediately, and they rose up out of bed at once, for the old couple were convinced that the man was a thief and robber, and that there were more of them nearby. Before they had time to put their clothes on, another man knocked the door in, and the one that was in the window ran around to the door, and both men come into the house. Whether there were any more men outside the house, it is not known. Only two came in the house. One of them was disguised, for his face was painted black. This man carried a pearl-handled pistol. My brother said he recognized the pistol. Now the entrance of the two robbers into the house created confusion, and they swore they would make Grandfather tell where his money was, or they would finish his life right then and there. My grandshire replied, you scoundrels cannot compel me to divulge its whereabouts. It is now that both men laid hands on him in a violent manner and threw him down on the floor. He was old and feeble and made but little resistance. They had hurled him to the floor, and one of them got on his breast and held him down. At this moment, my little brother leapt out of bed and says to the one that had paint on his face, 
Garl Wilburn, what did you come to kill my grandfather for? The pistol referred to formerly had belonged to Hickory Stark, and Wilburn had got possession of it. Neither one of the men made any reply to the remark of my brother. While the scuffle and confusion was going on, my grandmother hallooed as loud as she could to give alarm to anyone in hearing distance, and the bushwhackers told her if she repeated it, they would shoot her down. She now turned around and made a start as if to go out the house, and one man struck her a hard blow on the head with the pistol, which felled her to the floor, where she laid stunned for a few moments. After she revived, she rose to her feet and ran out of the house and started for Sam Van Zant's. In the meantime, the boy, Tom Jones, was so wrought up with fear that he was making a loud racket, and the two men ordered him to lie still and hide his face with the quilt, or they would blow his head off. The frightened lad obeyed without further warning. It was now that the demons began their awful crime of torture, and while one of the brutes still on the poor man's old body to hold him down on the floor, and with his feet tied fast together, the other man shoved his feet up a few inches to the fire, where they were held there for a short time. His suffering terrible, but he bore it, and not a word he said concerning the hiding place of his money. In the great agony of pain and anguish, he clutched the hot dog irons with his hands just to make an effort to move away from the fire, and when he let go of them, a piece of skin was jerked off the pan of his hand and fingers and stuck to the irons. The horrible torture was kept up a few minutes, and when the cutthroat ceased their brutal work, they made him rise to his feet, but his feet were so badly burned he could hardly be able to stand. The robbers were expecting to see some of the old man's friends come to his relief, and they decided to get away at once, and they informed the helpless old man that he had to go with them. He begged to be let alone, but they forced him to go. The robbers and their victim, who could hardly walk, passed out of the building and silently disappeared in the darkness and was gone. As soon as they left the house, Tom Jones jumped up out of bed and left the house in an opposite direction from the way the robbers went with my grandfather, and overtaken grandmother as she was hobbling and groping her way along the dark and lonely road. The boy was so demoralized that he ran ahead of her and never did come back any more. My poor, helpless, and feeble grandmother finally got to Mr. Van Zant's before daybreak. My little brother ran out of the house while the robbers were making my grandfather get out and take him with them, and he said afterward that he traveled seven miles that night before he stopped. He said after they had run near a mile from the house, he heard the report of a pistol, but he was laboring such under a strain of excitement and fear that he was unable to tell the direction the weapon was fired. This horrible crime occurred in the month of May, 1865, and there were but a few men and women living in the country, especially round Belfont. But what few people there were, they turned out willingly to search for grandfather's dead body, for we all knew that he had been murdered. We hunted day after day for him without the least success. When the old soldiers of both sides had returned home who lived in that locality, some of them helped us look for him but we were not able to find any trace of him. It was not that we reached the conclusion that they had taken him many miles before they had disposed of his life. There had been a fence just northeast of the Bristow house that was on the division line between the part of grandfather's land and what the man was name of Sloan. This fence had been destroyed by fire except for one panel that escaped. The thick grove of post-oak bushes and tall grass grew in this same fence corner that escaped the raging fire. This was three-quarters of a mile from where Grandfather was so cruelly tortured. We had all given up ever finding the remains or ever hearing from him any more. One morning in 1867, or two years after he was taken off, my stepfather, William Smith, heard his dogs treed, and on going on to him he found what was a coon that had chased, and it had went up the tree and he shot the coon. Now this is one and a quarter miles from his house. On his way back home, with the dead coon, he had happened to pass a few feet of the fence corner just named, and discovered pieces of clothing and a few bones lying in the grass and bushes that was in this corner. 
He stopped and examined the bones and remnants of cloth. It was evident that the bones were human and that the age it had belonged to. Mr. Smith now hurried to the house and told the story of his find to the family and we all believed it was the remains of my dear old grandparent. The neighbors were notified at once and it was not long before they had gathered at the place designated and after a thorough examination of the pieces of clothing and teeth all who knew him were convinced that they belonged to grandfather. At the time of discovery my grandmother was living in Newton County, Arkansas and was up on a visit the day previous and had started on the return home early that morning and a runner was sent to give her the news of the discovery and she was overtaken at Plez Fowler's where she stopped to remain overnight and she came back and was present at the burial of the remains of her husband which received interment on the old farm one mile east of Belfont and as far as I know my grandfather's money was never found the people who made such strong exertions in searching for the body said that they had passed fifty or sixty yards of this spot but never thought of going to it to look for him there.